honorable principal of the college dr v ravindra babu esteemed vice principal academics dr g prasad veteran vice principal administration b karun kumar distinguished director of the english language teaching center dr p ramanujam renowned eltn dr jacob tharu uh, my teacher dr rajneesh uh, the dynamic resource person of the today's webinar dr vijaya srivatsava hods of different departments of our institute the coordinators of this webinar mr rajkumar and mr rajkiran the moderator mr shiva and all my colleagues who are involved in this workshop and the enthusiastic participants good morning every one of you i welcome you all to this webinar and that's the fourth day of this webinar on strategies for effective assessing and teaching and i would like to now take the privilege of introducing the today's resource person dr vijaya sri watsava before she begins her presentation Dr. Vijaya Srivatsava is an assistant professor of English from the English and Foreign Languages University Lucknow. She has taught at the EFLU Hyderabad and at Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus. Her areas of interest are curriculum design and material production, teacher training, language testing and second language acquisition. She has taught students for various uh, linguistic backgrounds, Indian and international at different levels. She has published three book chapters with TESOL, Virginia, the US. She has a PhD, MPhil, and PhD from the EFLU, Hyderabad. And may I now request Dr. Vijaya to make a presentation on her topic: online assessment, new tools, and challenges. Ma'am, would you please make a presentation? Thank you. Ma'am, uh, your voice is not audible. Please, could you unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me and can you see me now, Dr. Vijayalakshmi? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin first by thanking everyone who has been a part of this beautiful webinar. I have attended all of them and enjoyed listening to my colleagues, Professor Rama Matthew and. Uh, Dr. Lina Mukhopadhyay, um, welcome to my session. It's on online assessment. Uh, a very warm welcome to Professor Jacob Tharu. As I didn't know you were attending, I'm a little scared if I may say so. Uh, a warm welcome to my students from Hyderabad and Lucknow campus and all the colleagues in the audience. Thanks for being here. I'd especially like to thank Dr. Vijay Lakshmi and uh, members of the organizing committee who made me a part of this specialized webinar. I'd also take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Ravindra Babu, the principal of the college, uh, Dr. Karuna Kumar, the vice principal administration, Dr. Prasad, vice principal academics, Dr. Ramanujam Parthasarthi, the director of ELTC, and uh, of course, last, last but not the least, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi for including me in the program. And of course, how can I forget Dr. Raja Kumar for being so patient and helping me understand Microsoft Teams because I was sort of new to it. I've used Google Teams and um, other apps. I was new to Microsoft. So thank you so much, Mr. Dr. Raja. Now, uh, let me share the presentation so that you're able to see it. Now I think you're only able to see me. So. Please bear with me. I'll just upload my presentation. Uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, are you able to see my slides? Could you confirm? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, Are you able to see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to begin on a sort of lighter note with a cartoon. 
I'm sure that's how many of our students feel regarding the cold blooded summative assessment. I'm exaggerating a bit here, of course. I can actually visualize some of our students vigorously nodding to say yes, yes, that's how we feel when we get the results. Take a few seconds to read this side slide, please. On formative assessment. You've been a part of the last few sessions on formative assessment. We certainly need to consider evaluation and assessment in a new light. A positive incremental way of gradually building our understanding of what student learns is required. In the previous sessions, you've heard about formative assessment. I'm going to talk about formative assessment using online tools. Since the 1990s, educational researchers have increasingly argued that assessment should, should be used to support learning rather than just to test and certify achievement. Since the 90s, terms like formative assessment, assessment for learning, have become widely used, and these are contrasted with terms like sum summative assessment and assessment of learning. So formative assessment, as you might remember from the previous sessions, refers to activities that enable learners and practitioners to monitor learning, and also to use information generated to align later learning and teaching activities and materials. So much for online assessment. I'm sure all you people, all you non-technology people are chuckling and smiling to yourself. So I'm so sorry I got logged out due to the problem in connectivity. So I was talking about early 2020 when many institutions transitioned away from face-to-face -face instruction due to the global pandemic. And there was a sort of a scramble for online teaching and assessment. This was at time referred to as online teaching, but in fact it was, wasn't planned online teaching and assessment, but rather a crisis prompted remote teaching. Given the circumstances and the time frame for crisis online teaching, uh, it was quite obvious that quality expectations had to be lowered especially with regard to testing security, technological sophistication, accessibility, and learning outcomes as well. As a result, teachers were in fact left feeling dissatisfied because they were not able to match the standards of face-to-face -face teaching. This is a feeling that we are all left with at the end of this semester in our university. We've just finished a semester and do, we do feel that we are not able to match up to face-to-face -to -face teaching. But you know, I feel it's all right. We know that with time and practice, technological skills pertaining to language teaching and evaluation will develop and evolve. And we will all get a hang of it and do well eventually if we keep at it. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I'll be speaking about three major aspects of online assessment today. I'll address some major questions and issues and talk about technology enhanced assessment, learning through technology enhanced assessment. And I'll talk about um, some assessment tools and there will be some tips for you. OK, now I want you to have a look at this. This cartoon actually, if you look at it, it highlights a serious, serious issue in assessment. It brings out what impact grades have on our learners. It actually leads to the larger question of whether we should at all be assigning grades. But of course, I will not go into that debate here now. Uh, we will begin with thinking about if we are ready for online work to begin with. Let's start with that question. Uh, excuse me, madam. Uh, yes. 
sorry for the inconvenience uh, would you please minimize the teams application on your screen at uh, right side corner just minimize that small one is, because it is, it is seen on the slide okay i'll just uh, just minimize thank thank you so much thank you okay okay thank, thank, you, thank you thank yeah so let's go on to whether we are ready for online work to begin with Now I'd begin with talking about what are the prerequisites for successful online community because that is the basis for successful online teaching and assessment. So I'll begin with that. So the first thing that comes to our mind is when it comes to successful online communities is These people possess requisite technical knowledge to navigate the platforms being used to utilize. So awareness and familiarity with platforms is important. Next. They need to develop requisite reflective and evaluative competencies, so they should be able to think about their own learning, keep track of their own learning and be critical of their own competencies. It's not easy. It's easier said than done. And they should be able to exhibit ongoing sustained engagement. And collaborate with other part participants. Now for a minute, I'd like you to pause and ponder here. What are the competencies that are needed for Internet inquiry? Now, who really is a successful online learner? Let's talk about that now. A strong successful learner has a strong academic self concept. Exhibits fluency in the use of online learning technologies. She possesses interpersonal and communication skills. Not always true, but yes, ideally required for being a successful online learner. Because when it comes to online learning, there is a lot of peer assessment uh, and a lot of interaction is required with the community. A successful online learner understands and values interaction and collaborative learning. Yes. In fact, I had a student recently in my you know, last MA semester and he had this issue that he would not be a part of any group work. He actually came and told me that I don't want to be a part of any group work. So a learner like that might find himself disadvantaged when it comes to online work. A successful online learner uses past experience to develop new learning. Motivated by intrinsic rather than extrinsic factors. Actually, intrinsic factors become more important. Here as compared to face to face learning because the onus is on the learner more so. This learner is able to set his own goals for learning, evaluate and monitor his own learning, has a problem solving approach towards learning and selects his or own, own learning strategies and materials because a lot of um, work in formative online assessment is independent work. There has to be a sense of inquiry and the learner should be able to select his own learning materials. A successful online learner is able to develop a time management strategy and is active in online discussions, uses materials or finds a way to apply newly learned concepts. So application to be able to apply is important. He's able to ask questions, stays motivated and shares what works best for her with the teacher. Now this is crucial for us as teachers. If learners do not tell us how they are responding to our online assessment and instruction tasks, it can get a little difficult in online formative assessment. Right. 
Take a few seconds to see this, please. assessment is the systematic process of documenting and using empirical data on the knowledge, skills and attitudes and beliefs of learners. By conducting assessment, teachers try to improve student learning. The objectives remain the same, whether we are talking about online or off offline assessment. So the, the objective here is not to clear an examination. In fact, the objectives, objective is to be how to improve student learning. And in fact, online formative assessment makes it somewhat easier because you have so many tools at your disposal. Now, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of on online assessment. The use of online assessment saves, of course, a lot of time and money. And often the assessment that can be completed in less time, multiple candidates can complete the on online assessment at the same time. Test takers are able to take the assessment at home. Now that's important in a time like this. And it, it's also important because students are able to um, answer and work on these tasks in a space where they are comfortable. They can do it from home using their own devices. You get to see their results for teachers. You get to see their results and answers and get instant feedback about the topic. That helps you as a teacher to learn more about your learners and adapt to their needs, their strengths and weaknesses. Now disadvantages. Uh, I feel not much can be said about the disadvantages of online assessments. Um, I think the advantages outweigh them by far. But there are some, of course. You need to be computer literate to begin with, of course. You need to have a computer in the Indian context. That is also an issue with some learners. In order to, uh, of course, create as well as take assessments. Technology is always not very reliable. There might be connection or Internet problems, which I just face. So this goes on to show that these issues remain energy breaks and other things like that. And of course, last but not the least, there's there's, a, there's often a, a cost involved if you want to buy online assessment softwares. So online assessments do have some pros and cons. It's up to us to decide what's the best option in our case, whether to keep using hard copy assessments or to go online. And some financial investment is required if you want to buy online assessment software. What's interesting for me here is that online assessments allow the test takers to take. Uh, to work on mobile learning. Now that's for me interesting because um, this semester after students were sent home, many of them went home to remote areas. Uh, there were connectiv connectivity issues, but many of them were still able to access the classes and the materials sent thanks to the mobile. So that is a very significant takeaway for me from online learning. And so therefore that means that they can uh, they can take their assessments anywhere, anytime, and they receive their results immediately by email. Uh, now, what is required to engage learners and support them? What do we need to do as practitioners on our part? Uh, one is. There must be a variety of assessment strategies, so uh, it shouldn't be just um, uh, an essay type question or a multiple choice 
or explain with re reference to the context. So those are traditional formats. And if you overdo those formats, learners, you, you are not able to engage the imagination of learners. You, you lose their interest. So we need to use diverse formats also because the learner needs are also diverse depending on the personality of each learner and the socio-cultural background of each learner their needs are different the proficiency of the learners are different their needs are different in online assessment it has been found that reflection using self-assessment is a significant tool so if you can you know get them to think about their own errors that they've made their own um, you know grades why did they get certain grades or and things like that it that really helps them grow and of course uh, online assessment uh, gives us a very significant invaluable opportunity to encourage original thought if you are able to use web quests, for instance, to give you an example, a lot of students can be encouraged to work on their own and produce an original piece of work. It's become now possible. Of course, at the same time, you need to be careful about plagiarism. For that, you need to be familiar with plagiarism softwares and you need to get smart just as our learners. We need to be as smart as, as our learners nowadays, of course. So. And of course, um, we need to kind of brace up and uh, get a hang of the kind of plagiarism softwares and things which are available in the market to discourage cheating. Now, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is technology enhanced assessment. Uh, there are other terms also used in the field. Of course, I'm referring to it as technology enhanced assessment. Uh, another term is technology rich assessment, which is used in the literature. So. Technology enhanced assessment is a broad term that encompasses the diverse methods by which technology can be used to support management and delivery of assessment. TEA does not simply mean replacing existing assessments with digital versions, but rather it actually means making use of the assumptional and pedagogical issues of assessment. So it's not just a matter of taking the same tasks and formats which we've been using in face-to-face -face teaching and converting them, taking them straight away to online assessment. No, that's not what it means. Now, what does technology have to offer to us? Technology, when it comes to designing instructional materials and making our assessments, it offers greater variety and authenticity in the design of assessments. Variety, definitely. Sky is the limit. Improve learner engagement, for example, through interactive formative assessments with adaptive feedback. <laughs> Choice in timing and location of assessments. So um, if you are using technology enhanced assessment, learner gets a choice uh, regarding when to take the assessment and where. We are able to capture wider skills and attributes not easily assessed by other means. For example, through if you're using something like simulations, interactive games or e-portfolios, so you can actually bring in more creative ways of assessment through online assessment. Submission can now be uh, done easily in a very efficient way. Uh, if you're using automated marking, let's say if you're able to use your organization is able to, to buy a software for writing assessment, a lot of the assessment then becomes automated 
and you also can store all this data. So what happens is uh, this data that you store actually becomes a part of the larger uh, proficiency portfolio of the student. Um, then, of course, it helps us be consistent in our assessments. And we get more accurate results, especially if you're using automated solutions. Of course, um, it is not enough to just use automated solutions. The teacher will be required for the overall commenting on, let us say, writing. But yes, um, automated assessment does help in a very big way, especially if you're dealing with larger classrooms. Technology, with the use of technology, we are able to uh, use innovative approaches which are based on creative media and online peer and self-assessment. Assessment can be accurate, timely. You get immediate feedback. And there are increased opportunities for learners to act on feedback. For example, uh, if you're using e-portfolios, there can be a reflection section where they comment on what they've learned and where they've gone wrong. Next, I'm going to talk about dynamic assessment in L2 learning. Some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, I thought of talking about it here today because we need to evaluate and understand what's not right with the way we've been assessing our students so far in face-to-face -face context as well. Why it has not been enough. Please take a few seconds to read this quotation. So dynamic assessment in second language learning is defined by Jeffrey Lids here. Based on Vygotskyan principles of mediation and zone of proximal development, dynamic assessment not only measures not only an individual's independent problem solving ability, but it also measures his or her potential for development when provided with help. Dynamic assessment has been brought into the second language acquisition field through the pioneering work of Vygotskyan researchers Lantolf and Fiona. Vygotsky believed that a primary locus of cognitive development was in collaborative problem or task-based dialogue between a learner and a more knowledgeable peer. Through such dialogue, the smarter peer gauges the amount of mediation that learners require in order to complete a task and get help. The zone of proximal development here is in fact the metaphorical space between the learner's actual learner, the, uh, learner's actual level of development and her potential when provided with help. According to Vygotsky, the underlying processes of learning were just as important as the learner's ability to carry out a task independently. The goal of assessment in Vygotsky's views is to diagnose not only abilities that are fully developed, but also those that are still in the process of maturing. In other words, assessment should promote development and not just measure it. Uh, let's talk about traditional assessments. So traditional assessments such as paper pencil tests actually seem to fall short of uh, providing a comprehensive view of learners mental functioning because they can only bring to light fully developed abilities. They don't focus on diagnosis of abilities that are still maturing. For example, I'll give you an example of a close passage test of verbs in past tense. So a close passage would only reveal if the learners were able to provide the appropriate words on their own at a point of time. In order to understand learners' ability to narrate in the past and help them overcome their difficulties, the teacher would need additional information about the learner's potential if provided with help. 
uh, the teacher would need to know how much mediation is necessary. A common conclusion drawn from learners poor for performance on a close passage is that learner has not learned it. However, from a Vygotskyan point of view, this would be a hasty and faulty assumption. Next, I'm going to talk about technology enhanced assessment, learning through technology enhanced assessment. Various technologies are now available to us to support the paradigm shift from face to face to online formative assessment. Our curricular space has been by and large calm, stable space, unchanging based on face to face interactions so far. Suddenly, in the post COVID situation, we are all forced to make a massive shift. Now, how do we begin to undertake the new responsibilities that address the necessary changes in the world? The way to implement the necessary changes in assessment is to firstly recognize the significance of formative assessment. Secondly, embrace the online tools. And thirdly, avoid getting bogged down by technology and find existing smart solutions to facilitate learning and assessment. Many useful tools are available to us online, and I'm sure all of you have been exploring them in the last semester. Our role as educators here becomes very important. We must appropriate these tools in ways that will nurture this paradigm shift from face to face to online formative assessment. Now I'd like to talk about technology enhanced assessment and how to use that for reading assessment of reading. Uh, blogging is of course one way of assessing reading comprehension. And there is enough material online which you can look at regarding experiments on this. I'm going to uh, talk about go on and talk about. Of course, I'll go back for sorry. I, I think I need to tell you that uh, there are tools which are available to assess reading comprehension online and uh, I will talk about it later. First, I need to talk about writing. So I'll begin with talking about digital storytelling. Uh, this is uh, from a study by Sylvester and Greed. It's a 2009 study. This is uh, from an article which was published in Reading Teacher. The article is called Digital Storytelling, Extending the Potential for Struggling Writers. So I want to briefly tell you about this study. The study provides examples of digital stories. You will have access to this because I will be sharing my PowerPoint presentation on Academia and I will share with you my Academia name so you can have access to this. A digital story is a multimedia text consisting of still images complemented by a narrated soundtrack to tell a story or present a documentary. Sometimes video clips are embedded between images. Creating digital stories acts as a motivator for students. In fact, they remain engaged through the project. Additionally, digital stories also provide an alternative form of expression for those students who struggle with writing traditional texts. Using this multimedia approach in classroom helps students discover their voice, their confidence and structure in their writing. This, of course, the examples of digital stories, you can access them. I will be sharing the PPT with you. Now 
I'll briefly tell you uh, about the three learners in this study, Kylie, Ray, and Colleen. Uh, the first author, Ruth, met, met these three learners uh, while conducting research on struggling writers. All three children were in the fourth grade. Their classroom teachers described them as struggling writers based on their writing performance. And children themselves perceived themselves as struggling writers based on their scores, the marks they were awarded. I'll briefly tell you about the kind of learners they were. So Kylie does not hesitate to begin a writing task once it is assigned and is eager to write. He circles his words in the first draft to indicate he is unsure of the spelling, but he does not access the resources available in the room to check for accurate spelling, nor does he make revisions. This child is a very artistic child and draws popular cartoon figures. Colleen is very creative with ideas, shares them during the pre-writing activities and includes them in her writing. But insufficient details leave the reader trying to connect the ideas to make sense of her text. So that is her problem. Rather than unfold events to develop a plot or transition between setting action and episodes, Colleen sums them up in a few sentences. Uh, of course, the other problem she has is that her writing is very um, illegible and it impedes the readability of her composition. Further complicating the transactional process between the reader and the text. The interesting thing about her is her read alouds are great. She she's great with performance and she does it with confidence. So uh, to talk, go on to talk about further talk about digital storytelling in this study. Now this is the this is how the storyboard look. When creating digital stories in a classroom setting, students go through the writing process of composing a story by traditional methods. To begin with, they use a paper and pencil. Um, or if children are able to type word processing functions. This composition later becomes a digitized voiceover narration. Once the composition is completed, images and frames that complement the narration are sketched onto the storyboard. Sections or paragraphs in the composition can be numbered. Personal photographs, clip art or any graphic that portrays scenes represented on the storyboard are collected. When students use media from the internet to enhance their stories, they are required to cite where they obtain these files from and they are also required to tell us about copyright information. This is significant for us. It makes the learners more responsible for the kind of referencing they're doing. The rolling credits at the end of the documentary or the film uh, are an ideal space to display this information. The story is recorded. And because the narrator's voice is what makes the story interesting, it, it's the learner themselves. It should be recorded as a performance, allowing the audience to hear the personal content and emotion in the voice. Knowing that a piece of writing will extend beyond the writer and the teacher. The teacher may motivate reluctant writers to polish, clarify confusing parts, entertain, inform. For some, it helps to complete a writing assignment. It motivates them. The aspects of writing, of course, can be graded in parts, allowing incremental learning to take place. In this section, I will make an attempt to demystify what might be some new areas uh, for some of us and talk about their relevance for assessment of writing. Despite the recent development of automated writing evaluation technology and the growing interest in applying this technology to language classrooms, studies on the efficacy of automated writing evaluation say that it can be a useful tool to facilitate writing development. Of course, here I'd like to say that uh, AWE, which I'm going to talk about, 
um, should be used as a supplemental tool instead of a replacement for teacher feedback because of numerous limitations. First, AWE cannot substitute for a real audience. The most noticeable advantage of AWE system is its capability to generate feedback immediately. Writing instructors can save time by incorporating AWE into writing curricula, focusing instead on the higher order aspects of student writing. So there can be a basic feedback which is given by this AWE, the automated system, and the overall feedback on higher order aspects can come from the teacher. Students can access the AWE systems and submit their writing for evaluation from anywhere, anytime. And the immediacy of feedback enables practice in writing with no human effort possible. In addition, second language writers using an online AWE system can conveniently and efficiently consult internet resources for information on language use and idea development. The convenience of computer technology can enable learners to develop autonomy, which is a significant factor in learning. The two most common AWEs used in Asian classrooms are the criterion from ETS and uh, my access from Vantage. The criterion from ETS ETS, as you know, is the uh, the educational testing service, the international testing body, which is well known for its famous international test TOEFL. The criterion I'm going to talk about this one is a web based instructor led writing tool that helps students plan, write and revise their essays. It gives them immediate diagnostic feedback and more opportunities to practice writing at their own pace. There are two more which I have listed. Write and improve from Cambridge English and write to learn from Pearson. So I'll briefly tell you about uh, the criterion by ETS. So here is a screenshot of what it looks like. Online writing evaluation service. Now Criterion has an E-Rater scoring engine. Now all the TEAs, sorry, all the AWEs have E-Rater scoring engines which are used for evaluation. The E-Rater scoring engine provides diagnostic trait feedback in five key categories. There are many more categories. I've just listed some of them here. It also differs from um, AWE to AWE. So the five categories are grammatical, usage, mechanics, style, organization, and development. Now these are used by the student to guide their process of revision. So student gets feedback in these categories. So uh, I have put down the categories which the criterion generates. So um, the study which I have referred to shows that the grammatical errors were generated in these categories, fragments, run-on sentences, garbled sentences, and you can see it yourself. Now, the last one, you might be wondering what is proofread this? Proofread this is actually mistakes that are difficult to label as specific errors. So those are the uncategorized errors, which learner is advised to work on. This is a screenshot. I don't know if you're able to see it's just to give you an idea of how the feedback is generated. Uh, you can see the highlighted parts in black. These are where the errors are. And if you uh, kind of move your cursor over that area, it shows you the kind of error uh, you've committed and gives you a suggestion of what to do.
Uh, some, of course, uh, let me tell you this. Some AWE tools give students access to writing samples as well as online dictionaries. And uh, teachers also get access to additional aids such as plagiarism detection as a part of the AWEs that you buy. I put down from Lao 2015. This is a study I came across in ELTJ English Language Teaching Journal, a very famous ELT journal from the Oxford University Press. So this is how the feedback looks. So it generates error types. So there are two categories that I've put down here, put down here, fragments and ill-formed words and the example that is underlined, the, the error that is underlined and then the comments. So it gives you suggestions like proofread the sentence to be sure that it has an independent clause with a complete subject and predicate. Next, I will be talking about self and peer assessment. Uh, I'm going to talk about a researcher, Dr. Phil Davies, and about his experience with using computer computerized assessment by peers. This was developed at the University of Glamorgan. Recently, the system was extended to introduce peer and self-assessment into an assignment based on digital storytelling. Storytelling is one of the oldest methods of transmitting knowledge, but still proves a challenging assignment. Now, that's something, uh, there is one thing that I'd like to share with you that I've seen, I've taught primary and secondary learners as well as, um, you know, learners in higher studies. Storytelling, let me tell you, never fails with any kind of learners. It's a great format. Students have to know their topic well to tell the story in a powerful and accurate way to bring to life a particular viewpoint on the topic requires real engagement. So we are talking about, uh, I'm kind of going away a little from language learning. We are talking about computing learners here. Computing students studying a module on e-learning produced a five minute presentation with full academic ref referencing on web accessibility standards and color blindness. So that was uh, what they were working on, web accessibility standards and color blindness. The presentation was to be given from the viewpoint of a colorblind person. They had to inform the audience about the disability. Also show the impact color blindness has on that person's life. So it was found that in the process, students also demonstrate their multimedia skills. After submission, presentations are available for peer review in a shared folder on the network. After looking over peers' works, students submit self-assessment using the computerized assessment by peers. That's a system that they have. Only then do they use the system to assess and give feedback to their peers after completing their own self-assessment. And it has been found that learners were shown to be much more thoughtful about the feedback they gave to others as a result. Yeah, so this is an opinion. This is something I came across. This guide to technology enhanced assessment and feedback. The reference is given in my list of references at the end. I'll be showing it to you. So, does sound like some of our learners as well. It can get a little boring and dull. Yeah. Now I'm going to uh, kind of go into a slightly different area and talk about vocational training, assessment for skills training here, because I'm aware that there might be researchers 
and teachers in the audience who deal with vocational training. So I'm going to talk about educational and skills online. This is an assessment tool designed to provide individual level results that are linked to uh, measures of literacy, numeracy, and problem solving in technology rich environment. The survey measures adults proficiency in key information, information processing skills, literacy, numeracy and problem solving and gathers information and data on how adults use their skills at home, at work and in the wider community. All the results of this tool, education and skills training are comparable to the measures uh, which are used by different countries and internationally. In addition, the assessment contains non-cognitive measures of skill use, career interest and health and well-being as well. So let me just share with you what are the skills assessed as a part of this. Right, here are the skills which are assessed as a part of this. Organizations providing adult literacy and numeracy training who wish to have information that can help diagnose the strengths and weaknesses of learners and evaluate the results of training against national and international benchmark benchmarks are the organizations who are using this. Uh, so educational institutions such as universities vocational education and training centers can use education and skills online as a diagnostic tool for incoming students to understand their need for the courses. Take a few seconds to see this. Right, so this is basically to say that you cannot replace, replace human mind and you cannot replace the teacher, therefore. So I am advocating online assessment, but of course the final holistic overall assessment must be done by the teacher. We cannot completely rely on online assessment tools. Now, what I'll do is I will give you a Google form to work on. Uh, let me paste it in the Q&A and maybe you can respond to it. Um, Dr. Raja? Dr. Raja? Dr. Vijay Lakshmi? Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. So I'm just uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, paste uh, a Google form link in the Q&A section and I want you to take a few minutes to answer that Google form. Please bear with me. I'm just uh, trying to get that link and paste it for you. In the meanwhile, may I have one of the organizing committee people on board, please? Could you please come online and help me out with this? I hope you're able to see me.
OK, so I'm posting the Google form link. Please use this link to respond to the quiz that I'm sending you. It will take a few minutes. It's, it will take some reading to read it. There is a little reading to be done, so please do that. And uh, send it to me so that you know I can get your responses and talk about it. Dr. Yeah, ma'am, you want? Yeah. Am you want I to share? Yeah. Uh, I have shared the link. Is it visible? Uh, one minute, madam. On just a minute. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it is visible, madam. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just pause for a few minutes for the participants to do this. Uh, okay. Dr. Raja, how much time do I have? Uh, ma'am. Uh, yeah, 15 more minutes, ma'am. 15 minutes, okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Raja, could you publish all the comments which have been put on Q&A? Yeah, sure, ma'am, sure. We'll do that. Uh, Please, so that I can also see. Yeah, now on the screen you can see all the Q and A, madam. If you because you are on actually you are on Teams app itself. In right. Q A you will find everything, and at the end of the session also I will send you all the. Uh, ma'am, once again, will you just post that link, madam? Once again, because for some it's not visible, it seems. Okay. Make an announcement in the announcement. In the announcement, I you just post. Yes, I have put it in announcement. Yeah, OK. Please have a look and tell me whether it is visible. Yes, you will. Yes, it, it's visible here, madam. For the participants, let's just see. Yeah. Open, you, open. You. Yeah, link is visible, madam. Right. Yeah. So I will just give everybody a few minutes to do this. Sure, sure, madam. Okay, madam. So I have got a few responses by Dr. Tissa Anthony. Hello, Dr. Tissa. I didn't know you were attending. And Dr. Rama Devi, Dr. Raja. Thank you so much. And Dr. Joseph from Christ University. Dr. Vasanti. Then there is Mamta, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Tulsi, thank you. Got your response?
I don't know, some of them say that they are not able to access the link, but for some others it is working. Okay, so how do we send it to them? Can we send it on chat or something? Yeah, uh, in the WhatsApp group we will send that, madam. We will try to send it uh, through WhatsApp groups. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Are you able to see me or uh, what is seen on the screen? I don't know. What is that, ma'am? Uh, Dr. Raja, are you able to see me or are you yeah. able to see my PPT? I am able to hear you, madam. Can you see me? Yeah, I am able to see you. Okay. Start playing it. Now, this is a video on creativity. How to help your students become more creative through tasks. And it also answers this question of what is creativity, what it means in learning. This is from the, uh, the website of the American Psychological Association. So I'm just going to play this. This is going to be the end of my session. Of course, I will address some of your questions and the responses that you've given me after this. About how to better understand and its role in the classroom. The presentation is... Is it loud enough? Dr. Yes, madam, it's it okay. Oh. Ah, yes, yes. Six segments. Each segment addresses a question aimed at helping teachers develop... ...teachers about how to better understand creativity and its role in the classroom. The presentation is organized into six segments. Each segment addresses a question aimed at helping teachers develop their understanding of creativity and its role in their classroom. Those questions are, why creativity now? What can creativity add to your classroom? What blocks creativity? What do you need to do to develop the creative potential of your students? What can you do to be more creative in your own teaching? Where can you go from here? Theme one. Defining creativity. Creativity involves newness and appropriateness that fits a particular situation. A standard definition typically has two components. It has a novelty component, something creative has to be new and different, but it also in recent years people have decided that newness, novelty isn't enough. You also need to have an appropriateness criterion. There has to be um, a sort of a contextual element to it. So it's definitely doing things that are different, that are useful. But I think you have to define different and useful uh, based on the individual. Creativity in my mind is the ability to kind of open up your mind and let things in that might not normally um, be there. It's sort of an openness a kind of flow state that you can get into where you're experiencing and thinking of things that are different than the norm, a little outside of the traditional ideas of what should happen and trying to think about what's possible or what you thought might be impossible and how you can make it possible. Creativity is looking at something and adding your own flair to it. I define creativity as taking ideas that are not related and finding ways in which they connect. My definition of creativity, I would say that it's a unique and special way for um, people in this world to express and communicate with this world, like express themselves and interests. And my definition of creativity is someone who can look at something and see combinations of things in ways that have never been seen before. Creativity to me is finding different answers, different approaches to problems uh, that are outside of the norm. Creativity means just getting to like kind of express how you feel about that and like if you're drawing a picture then you can like do exactly what you think that that would be and that kind of stuff. So like if you're drawing a tree, you can do exactly what you think would be in that tree or what exactly what would be around it. Creativity to me means really giving kids the opportunity for choice 
and allowing them to explore different ways to address a particular problem or issue. Theme two, creativity is a capacity everyone possesses. When I have an idea or a, a little kid has an idea, a new insight that's new and meaningful, that by definition is creative, but maybe nobody else recognizes, isn't that still creativity? You know, in other researchers that have talked about this, and we call that level of creativity mini C creativity. It's recognizable to the individual, him or herself, and typically children, but even legendary creators have these kind of moments of inspiration that maybe only they recognize, right? But then they have the knowledge and skills and capacity to kind of take it to higher levels. And so what we recognize is that little kids are having this all the time. They're having these momentary insights. Anytime they're making a, a meaningful connection, it's a part of the learning process. The key point here is it's not about what you do, art, science, et cetera. It's about how you do it, that you can bring a certain orientation and qualities to your life and make just about anything creative. I try to bring creativity into the classroom as much as I can. Not only do students naturally wish to be creative, but it's really what engages them through the process. If we did not have creativity in the classroom, it would just be really dull and unexciting, and I wouldn't really get to know who my students are as individuals. Create. One of the best ways to understand how creativity and learning go hand in hand is to make a connection to your existing curriculum. When developing an assignment, try adding one or two additional directions that encourage students to express divergent and unique thinking. Creativity researchers in China demonstrated how math teachers cultivated creative expression by simply asking their students to come up with as many solutions as possible when solving math problems. In this way, students can deepen both their mathematical and creative competence. Theme 4. Creativity requires a willingness to play with ideas, be open, and take risks in a safe atmosphere. I think one thing that we need to get past is that that um, Americans, and I'm not sure if this is true for other countries, but the research has been done here. Um, we generally think that if something is fun, it's not necessarily productive. And so there have been studies that have shown that if you teach people in two different ways, one's a very dry, rote, boring lecture, and the other is game playing, goofing around, but with a purpose. Um, at the end, if you test those people, the people who had fun are generally going to do better. They were more engaged, they understand it better, but when you ask which group, which one they think learned more, it was the serious boring group. And I think the real takeaway from that is that we've become convinced that in order for it to be school-based and learning, it has to be boring. When I did my Master's of Education, there wasn't really much talk about what's fun in the classroom. There's a lot of discussion of how to maybe lead a discussion or how to teach essay writing. Um, but really, when we teach kids, we should remember that it's supposed to be fun. Um, they need to be engaged through this. And so creativity is a wonderful way to just try to open them up and, and show them that learning isn't necessarily a task, but it's something that's enjoyable and we can all we can all participate in together. If I were a teacher, I would probably risk to go in a lot of different paths. Segment review and reflection. Summing up, we've covered three themes. Creativity involves newness and appropriateness that fits a particular situation. Creativity is a capacity everyone possesses. Creativity and learning can go hand in hand creativity enriching subject matter learning, and subject matter learning enhancing creativity. Creativity requires a willingness to play with ideas, be open, and take risks in a safe atmosphere. You can pause the presentation to think about any of the questions we ask. Does the way in which the creativity was described provide new insights into how you might think about creativity in your own classroom? In what ways do these descriptions expand your own view of your students and your own creativity? What new possibilities for teaching and learning come to mind when you think about these descriptions? What questions and concerns do these descriptions raise for you as a classroom teacher? How might you attempt to address these questions and concerns? In reflecting on these themes, how do they fit with or challenge your own conceptions of creativity? Segment two, what can creativity add to your classroom?
advocates of creativity have long stressed the importance of including creativity. Right, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here and uh, now I'm going to go back to the Q&A window and uh, I will be posting a link to this so you can watch this at leisure whenever you wish to. Uh, but right now what I would like you to do is in the Q&A box. Please type something. I'll tell you what you have to do. You need to think about your teaching and learning context in the light of the definition of creativity and what you just heard. Give me some instances of creativity from your classroom, especially assessment in your classroom. Have you tried something interesting which has worked in formative assessment? Um, give an example from your class or, or alternatively, you could also talk about new possibilities that you have discovered in the process of today's presentation. So please take a few minutes and do that. Think of instances of creativity or think of new possibilities to build in creativity in your instruction and assessment. Excuse me, madam. Yes. Uh, let me Are make you? a small announcement for, for the participants. Yeah. Uh, yeah, participants, Are if the given you? links are not working for you directly from QEA box, please copy them and then paste it somewhere and then just click on it and it will work. Either in a message box or in WhatsApp messages. If you just paste it and then send it to somebody and then click on it, you would be automatically directed to feedback forms. So please do that. I have posted a question. Are yeah, you able to see? I wonder. Uh, are they posting responses? Because I'm not able to see the responses. Uh, you can check on new new messages, madam. Actually, you have three options there: new, published, and dismissed. So click on new, and you will find the responses. Madam. They are typing. Uh, participants are typing their responses. Yeah. Uh, can you help me publish all of these please because if it is not published, I am not able to see the new ones. OK, one minute. Could you publish all of them? I'm just not able to access the new ones. OK. Uh, Dr. Raja, could you read out some of the responses because I am not able to see what they are typing. Um, are they typing? Are they typing something? Uh, they have posted uh, one question is here, ma'am. No, not the questions. I've asked them for some responses. I I've made an announcement. Madam. You announce that please type instance of creativity here. Yes. Example. 
examples from your class or new possibilities? Have they responded? Uh, some of them are doing that, ma'am. Just a uh, uh, two people uh, type their responses this moment. We can encourage questioning in the classroom for creativity. And the other person's response, the names of the participants are not seen here. They joined the sessions as anonymous anonymous. And second one is, do you think creativity is given importance in Indian education system? You're answering a question with a question. But, but that's what actually they have typed on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I actually needed examples from your class, from your own experiences uh, of creativity, how you've been able to build in creativity in assignments, in tasks that you gave them, classroom tasks that you gave them. Uh, some of the experiments that I have described, for example, this digital storytelling experiment. Now that is one that incorporates creativity in responses. And similarly, there can be use of e-portfolios and things like that, which um, you know encourage learners to be creative. Um, I remember I had conducted an experiment with my learners where uh, we had an entire proficiency curriculum which was based on watching films. So these were films which were specially chosen from the point of view of adaptations. So they were basically uh, films which were adapted from uh, actual novels. So for instance, one of them was Beautiful Mind. So uh, we took parallel text. So for reading and writing, the beautiful mind, especially the prologue was taken for reading and writing. Uh, it has a beautifully written prologue on the life of uh, uh, this mathematician. And we took uh, the film and excerpts from the films that played for listening and speaking practice. So this entire material was used for uh, not just instruction, Different activities were used, creative activities were used for formative assessment as well. So one of the things that they had to do in writing was that um, they had to imagine a different ending for the story. So that's something that you can use for writing. That can be a writing assignment. It helps them be creative. It, it, writes, it helps them write um, original stuff. So they cannot copy it from anywhere. It's not something they would get from the internet. So we do need to constantly build in creativity in our classrooms. If you believe that creativity is not given importance in the Indian education system, all the more reason it lies, the responsibility lies with us. We need to take on that responsibility and try to build in creativity in our classroom and assessment practices as well. Someone here has said we can encourage questioning in the classroom for creativity. Yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, instruction and assessment both need to encourage a sense of inquiry, which means the students should be allowed to ask questions. And also if possible, allowed to ask more than one question and give more than one answer to the same question. Why is it not possible to have two answers to the same question? We are kind of working in this multiple choice, summative evaluation, straight jacketed kind of uh, a framework where we are saying there can be only one answer. No, there can be more than one answers to a question. So that is incorporating creativity. So yes, any other questions? Uh, shall we wrap up Dr. Raja, Dr. Raj Kiran? Yeah, ma'am, we can. Uh, we'll st uh, stop the session now here, ma'am. And we'll answer a few of the questions that were posed by the participants. Our moderator, Mr. Shiva, is going to ask you a few questions. Yeah. So okay. I will just uh, take a few minutes to, um, you know, talk about the responses that I've got. I've got a lot of responses here for the um, 
you know the quiz that I had posted. I will just talk about that briefly. So uh, I wanted you to read this abstract and you can actually access it. This is a study on online extensive reading. If you're interested, you will find um, uh, a bigger write up on the Internet. And if you don't have access to it, I can send it to you. So primarily I wanted you to read this experiment because I did not have enough time to incorporate all of this in my presentation. Um, and I gave you a short question which was many teachers are not happy with learners choosing their own learning material. Why not? And you responded to it. Let me just share with you the responses. So I don't know if you're able to see this. Let me just go to the slide and show you uh, what exactly you said. Right. So uh, most people have said I would be happy if the students choose their own reading material. But many people have said also said it is difficult to control. What students are learning students may read material not relevant to the syllabus. So you see that is what is meant by the sense of inquiry. So when we are talking about extensive reading. The idea is that you encourage them to go beyond one text, explore the area and bring in text of their own choice pertaining to the area assigned. That is extensive reading and the whole creativity bit here comes in by way of. Students identifying text of their own and bringing it on board for reading. It would be something like a group assignment as well. So students reading material that is not relevant to the syllabus. For you administratively, that is an issue, but it's not a learning problem. It's a logistic administrative issue. Please do not confuse it and think that uh, it's a problem for learning. No, actually for for learning for a learner, it's a win win situation because the learner is reading more uh, and the learner is. Also exploring the creative side of himself or herself. And uh, I don't want to comment on difficulty to control what students are learning. I don't know if you remember what Professor Rama Matthew said in in her talk. That students may not always learn what you actually think you are teaching them. So learning for each student is individual. They have their own trajectories. You might be teaching the, the chapter and you think you are teaching certain particular words. But student might be learning some word which you've not even noticed. So um, there is actually no way we can control learning when we teach something. Yeah, for smoother transition to online teaching, I need to. Um, I'm very happy to see uh, you. We've, I've got some great responses here. Actually. I wanted you to have a look at this because this is an entire list of things which is provided by the guide that I have, uh, you know, um, put down in my references. It lists all of these. All of these various qualities for smoother transition to online learning. You need to be able to do all of these. Moving your course online. Lecture is the center of learning. Um, most of you have said yes. Uh, while some of you have said lectures are not boring. Uh, this is very interesting. Now the issue here is if you think lecture is the center of learning, the issue is that the autonomy is not with the learner. You have appropriated the power to yourself and your lectures. The focus is on the lectures. The focus is not the learner, the learning curve of the learner and the creativity and the imagination of the learner. You haven't given any power to the learner in that case. So uh, I think that is something that we need to think about. The majority of people think that lecture is the center of learning. This is very interesting. It's equally interesting to say is to see that people are saying lectures are boring. So 
it is time for all of us to sit and uh, sit up and notice these responses and actually think about this fact that has been revealed uh, through this quiz that a lot of people do believe that lectures are boring and lectures ideally should not be the center of learning. They should be an aid to learning, not the center of learning. So thank you very much. Now we will go on to the question answer sessions session. Uh, Dr. Rajkiran, could I have you on board? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Shiva is going to ask you a few questions, ma'am, now. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, madam. This is Shiva from Godwala Engineering College, Department of English. Good morning, Dr. Shiva. Yeah, first of all, uh, let me thank you on behalf of all the participants for a, such a scintillating and elaborate uh, session on assessment. Uh, uh, we had seen quite a good discussion on the chat board happening after the points you've been explaining it. Uh, we got few questions just for the want of time. We need to you know, shortlist the questions and present to you. Uh, I hope even participants would also understand this constraint and I thank you for them in advance. Madam, I, I would like to read out a question and if it's comfortable to you, you can immediately answer to it. Uh, I'll be very selective in questions for the reason of time. Um, so the first ahead. question is, yeah, the first question is uh, one of the participants is asking we need to use uh, different diverse formats for online assessment because the needs of the students are different. But the, uh, the teacher feels that when the faculty is handling a, you know, a large class of more than 60 or so, that is a general case in all technical institutions, uh, wouldn't it be burdensome for the teachers to create such a you know, variety of tests for single assessment? Uh, would you like to throw a light on it or can suggest some tips how we can go about that dilemma? Uh, well, there are a couple of things here. Uh, yeah, creation, of, creation of material is time taking and not everybody can do it. So yes, creation ma'am. of creation of assessments is also time consuming. So uh, there are uh, lots of uh, ready solutions available online which you can use. Okay. So for example, uh, there are a lot of online tests that you can use. I would, uh, for example, give you an example of something called Dialang. I don't know if you are aware of this. Now, I'm just typing this in the question answer session. Now, Dialang is a test which came out of the Common European Framework of References program. And uh, this is available online. Free of cost. Uh, could you please mute your mic, Dr. Shiva? Madam, I am doing it. There is a lot of noise. So Dialang is one test, for example, which is available free of cost. So there are a lot of free resources. What I will do is I have a list of free resources with me. I'm going to put it in the PPT and make it available to you. So I have a list of resources for all the four skills. I will make that available to you. But also something else that can be done is that um, you can have TAs working with you. Uh, students who senior students who help you with items uh, that way they also get to learn and um, online assessments especially the AWE that I was talking about um, when I spoke about um, technology enhanced assessment I was I remember I spoke about the criterion by ETS uh, they, and I also spoke about four other um, products in the market. They are free to access. Uh, you can use a kind of version of it for your learners uh, for writing assessment and uh, it will help you in a big way if your university can afford it. If they buy the whole package, then you will be able to really do large scale writing assessment and the overall holistic assessment can be done by you finally. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Question, yeah, that, that has happened much of it. Uh, and this takes me to the next question. Actually, some uh, most of the teachers have this uh, doubt whether the kind of summative assessments we conduct through uh, online platforms like Google Classroom or Google 
platforms uh, will that be authentic and will universities or uh, uh, academic bodies consider these kind of assessment as a valid assessment this is a question from one of the teachers uh, am i clear yeah. madam so um okay i'll i'll begin with countries where this is a norm so there are countries like us and uk where formative assessment is a norm in india there are universities where formative formative assessment is happening now there are lots of schools where formative assessment happens so uh, formative assessment in higher education probably is not the norm but let me tell you it's happening in india yes. and um, well as far as the uh, organizations that be are concerned yes. looks like they don't have a choice <laughs> regarding the results that you give so it's either yes, do formative yes. assessment online or yes. you don't do anything and if you're worried about plagiarism there are enough and more plagiarism softwares available which you can yes. make use of so uh, personally i don't see plagiarism as a problem i'll tell you why Madam. one is if you are constantly working with them on formative assessment you know immediately yeah well the how they're the doing student it student plagiarizes yes. and copies you yes, need to we, just once go through the script and you and know so that is another advantage you know your learners very well so the moment in the final exam you come across uh, plagiarized stuff you know plagiarized assignments that they have submitted because these days uh, we are accepting assignments we are doing assignments for final assessment yes madam even board exams are even uh, you know should plan to conduct on online so this wouldn't be a big issue now so if you have been building consistent consistently building let us say their writing portfolio you are familiar with the way they write you've been constantly looking at least you know a couple yes, of times you look at their writing example. you know when yes. it is plagiarized and then of course you have the plagiarism softwares also to help you yes 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 i think the constant being in constant touch with student student tasks help the teacher and the student as well in this case and in yeah, fact thank you your yeah, you know madam. google classroom i am using google classroom for my classes now google classroom has made it very easy just with a click you get okay. all the drafts of the student you just need to yes. go and click on the name of the student and you get everything that is submitted by the student so it's very yes, easy to compare and see yeah and a, a good uh, lms system they have been giving us for free i guess yes uh, and this is taking me to the another question from the participant uh, probably participant might be working in a government school uh, the participant is asking are there any low cost effective tools like google with much more facilities can you give that information or can we find the documents which you are willing to share uh, through us such kind of information like the websites uh, any tools that are easily available at low uh, cost see, for government schools um, see most of these that i have spoken about if your numbers yes. are small you can use the free version it's only when your numbers are very big you need to use the uh, the paid, paid version yes. yes and uh, of course uh, a lot of um, google uh, things are available free of course but uh, yes. i'm sorry a lot of the stuff is paid yes ma'am Uh, of course yes. as i said some of the tests are available for example dialang is a great test of proficiency now if you want to use a test of proficiency for your students and you want to see uh, what levels your students are um, this could be used as an entry level test also in different cases so uh, it's a computer adaptive test so you need to be online to take this test it gives you um, assessment of your abilities on listening reading writing okay. and grammar grammar and vocabulary yes right thank you madam thank you for that support uh, and i'm asking a question that may not be directly related to it but one of the participants is expressing a concern uh, does the nta national testing agencies uh, are they considering scientific principles of evaluation while they are testing teachers through net or set so i am sorry i was still clear of not answering that for the simple reason that i don't know Yeah, thank you ma'am it might be look let yeah. us let us let us really not discredit our apex organizations yeah. i'm sure they have a huge team working on it i, I yes 
probably that my yes. I mean I can tell you I've worked with the NCRT and they have okay. the best people working so I'm obviously sure. we don't need to doubt I, that I, yes I can't answer that actually <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Right, and this uh, now we are going to the uh, another important aspect of your lecture, ma'am. Uh, there are concern about uh, you know academic system established in our India, whether it is supporting creativity among students or not. If not, how teacher should equip himself or herself to handle this challenge? Yeah, I think this is something I've answered earlier, but uh, anyway. Uh, I'll address it again. Let us assume that our education system does not encourage creativity. However, let me tell you the 2005 NCRT position paper, uh, which was which came out of uh, the cur curriculum renewal process, which was conducted in 2005. If you wish, you can go and look at it. There is a section on creativity. So it is not as if our policy makers are not uh, envisioning it. it. They are yeah. not. Yes, it is not that. It's just that between policy making and implementation mm -hmm. somewhere. There lies the gap. Yeah. So all the more reason it is the responsibility of us teachers to be, bring oh, yes. creativity back to class through different activities. And, and all you need to do is yeah. be sensitive to your learners. Yes, sorry, Dr. Shivani. Yeah, as you suggested, we should be putting more efforts in it with sensitivity, as you mentioned right now, and interest to develop the students' abilities. I think that will answer this uh, challenge. Uh, I hope uh, participants have taken cue from this reply and try it in their classes. Uh, that's all for the questions, madam. And I am thank you for the you know patient answering for all the doubts, even though they have been repeated on the topics you've been already spoken. Uh, now I would like to hand over the session to my HOD, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, uh, convener of this webinar, and uh, she will be presenting the convener's report of the webinar. Yeah, you, I'll just uh, briefly. Please. I'd like to thank um, uh, a very senior professor, my teacher, Professor Jacob Tharu, for. Can you hear me? It's audible. Yeah. Startable, madam. Yes, I would like to thank Professor Jacob Tharu, a very senior professor from CIFL and from my days at CIFL. He's taught me. Thank you, sir, for being a part of my session. And uh, I'd also like to thank Professor Rajni Sharura, who I know is listening to me. He wanted to be a part of my session. Thank you, everybody, for listening in and bearing with me. Thank you. Yes, thank Dr. you, madam. Over to you. Uh, thank you, sir, and Mr. Shiva, and uh, thank you, ma'am. And now I would like to take the pleasure of uh, giving you the report of this four day uh, webinar uh, on strategies for effective uh, assessing and teaching. Well, um, uh, as all of us know, that the first day webinar uh, was held by Dr. Lina Mukhopadhyaya. Um, and uh, she gave us uh, an impressive presentation on performance based language assessment for ESL classrooms issues and uh, challenges, uh, wherein uh, she spoke about uh, complex assessment, uh, examples of uh, complex language assessment, and also how to do performance based ass language assessment, also. And she gave us five golden principles of language assessment. And uh, that was very informative. Uh, the participants really liked it very much. And on the second day of the webinar, Dr. Rama Matthew, she spoke on transformative assessment and formative assessment, uh, the four uh, steps of uh, FA, and how to initiate some autonomy uh, and uh, how to initiate some change uh, in, while, while doing some assessment and then uh, how to bring about change in the assessment process also. And on the third day, uh, she spoke on um, how do we keep uh, learning and growing as teachers. And in her presentation, she, uh, she emphasized on the benefits of the, the teacher research and how to adopt uh, uh, a research up, uh, which is appropriate to teaching. And we learned from her session the types of uh, teacher research and the key stages of the teacher research and the importance of reflection and also the, the uh, tools that we have to adopt and so on. And the fourth day webinar uh, the, that is uh, yours, webinar yours, and then uh, you made a very good uh, impressive uh, webinar on uh, um, the online uh, tools and then you also made us understand the formative assessment using online tools and prerequisites for successful uh, online 
uh, uh, communities and we also got to know uh, learning through uh, P, uh, TEA that is uh, technological enhancement assessment and we also gave us a good uh, detailed uh, video uh, on what is creativity and what are the impressions of people on creativity uh, and I hope all the participants might have really uh, uh, enhanced their knowledge if not to a great extent to, to some extent enhance their knowledge on uh, the strategies that they have to adopt uh, in uh, effectively assessing and teaching in the classrooms and I would also like to take uh, the opportunity of thanking all my management and my principal Dr. Ravinder Babu, the vice principal uh, academics uh, Dr. Prasad, the vice principal administration Dr. Karun Kumar and uh, the distinguished director of the English language teaching center Dr. P. Ramanujam and Dr. Asat Reddy for all uh, for all of them for supporting us in every way to conduct this program and uh, my special thanks are uh, due to Dr. Jacob, Jacob Tharu, uh, Dr. Professor Prakasham and Dr. Didla Grace who helped me a lot in sorting out you uh, resource persons and my heartful uh, thanks to you all, all the resource persons Dr. Lina Mukhapadhyay, Dr. Rama Matthew and uh, Dr. Vijaya for accepting my invitation and for being resource persons on this webinar. And I also thank my coordinators profusely, uh, Mr. Rajkumar and Mr. Rajkiran and uh, the moderator of this program, Mr. Shiva and all my colleagues, um, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Francis, uh, Mr. Nagaraj and Mr. Nagarjuna and the uh, technical support, uh, Mr. Sai and everybody uh, and particularly the participants without which the uh, webinar wouldn't have been possible really. I, I thank everybody uh, from the core of my heart uh, for being with us and for supporting, for, for supporting us to conduct this program. And uh, now uh, I would like to request Mr. Nagaraj to uh, propose the word of thanks. Thank you everybody for being with us and thank you very much and looking forward to seeing you all uh, in some other webinars. Thank you so much. Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, I'll, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, uh, if the participants can hear me, uh, I'd like to announce that I will be sending a feedback form to your email IDs. I've got your email IDs because you've responded. Yes. So please fill that feedback form for me. You will be receiving it in your email. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning everyone, I am B. Nagaraj, Western Professor of English, Pulau Engineering College. It gives me immense joy and pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of our institution. First and foremost, I would like to thank all the resource persons of the four-day webinar, Dr. Lena Mukhopadhyaya, Dr. Rama Matthew and Dr. Vijaya Srivatsava for their insightful talk. Today's presentation on online assessment, new tools and challenges is so informative. Definitely, madam, we will follow the guidelines that you give. I wholeheartedly thank our dynamic principal, Dr. P. Ravindra Babu, Vice Principal Administration, Dr. B. Karan Kumar, Vice Principal Academics, Dr. G. V. S. N. R. V. Prasad, and our management for giving us continuous support and encouragement to conduct various events in the department. I deem it a privilege to thank Dr. Ramanjum Parasardi, the unseen force behind the entire program. Thank you very much, sir, for your guidance and inspiration to conduct this webinar. I also extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Yam Vijayalakshmi, convener of the four-day webinar and coordinators G. Rajakumar and P. Rajkiran and the program organizer Shiva KK and the technical team for their tremendous job. They have been working for this program day and night for the last two weeks. Thank you, madam, and thank you, sirs. I also thank all the heads of the departments for their support. I immensely thank all the departments heads for their support. 
I thank all the participants for taking time from your busy schedule to join us and made this webinar a grand success. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, ma there's there's uh, somebody I, I really forgot to thank, uh, uh, ma'am. Everybody, yeah. participants. Uh, I heard uh, from uh, Miss Vijaya and also got to know from her last night that uh, the director of the uh, EFLU uh, center, Dr. Rajneesh, has been uh, uh, listening to the lecture and then he has been there as a participant. So it has been a great delight uh, to know that uh, you have joined the session and I, I really look forward to meeting you uh, uh, somewhere or somewhere in the future. And I really cherish the kind of moments I we had with you in your teaching uh, uh, sessions uh, as students. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, you all. Should visit us, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. You should visit us. I, it's time I will, to get back. One. I will. I will. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the support, uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you all participants for being with us. Thank Thanks. You. And have a great day.